So there is no lecture eight, very much like there is no rule six. The reason there's no lecture eight is because in lecture eight I go through the midterm, but one or two people for various reasons that were unable to take the midterm. Consequently, I would like them to do it uh, in their own time, but you can't get a mark for it because that time is past. But the important thing is the feedback you get from it, because it's supposed to be an uh, exercise in which you learn how much or little you need to do more to succeed. Um, and a number doesn't tell you that, but looking at how it went wrong does. So there is no lecture eight, but there will be eventually. <coughs> I just don't know where I'm going to put it yet. Lecture nine is today, and it's, it's going to be our rounding up the diodes. And then for seven weeks, you'll be back with Professor Houston for doing uh, bipolar transistors and MOSFETs and so forth from a semiconductor perspective. But then I'll be back from lecture, <coughs> in quotes, 10 onwards. So these are my lectures. So there's, there's like seven or eight lectures we've got. 10 or 12 lectures of his in between. And we'll be doing transistors in switching applications, a little bit of CMOS, some amplifiers, that's to say uh, analog transistor circuits, in 14, 15, 16, 17. Then we'll do some small signal analysis and we'll round it out with some op amps and I'll spend a couple of lectures going through past exams and telling you how to pass exams and not necessarily how to get a degree. So for today, uh, there will be an introduction because there always is. And then we'll discuss signals and what makes a small signal and what makes a large signal. And then we'll look at a large signal example. And having looked at that, I'll discuss how circuits are linearized. Now, the linearization of circuits is something that you are all familiar with. It's just I haven't explicitly said that's what we've been doing yet. So there isn't really anything new there. And then I want to give you an example of a small signal diode application. And then we'll discuss small signal circuits for a bit. And then we'll talk about some characteristics and we'll round it up with something on, on linearity and distortion. And of course, there is a bear at the end. So a signal, definition for a signal, if anybody asks, <coughs> in circuits that include active devices, that's diodes, transistors and so forth, a, a signal may be considered large or small. And the signal is large if the signal amplitude, that's y-axis height, is the same order of magnitude, so within a power of 10, of the turn-on voltage of the active device. And the signal is small if it doesn't match that criteria, or if it's the same order, much smaller than the, uh, the turn-on voltage. <coughs> so let's assume, for example, small and large signals don't only apply to to diodes, but a large signal would be sort of more than 0.7 or perhaps 0.5 if you have some DC offset attached. And a small signal would be a couple of hundred millivolts or less. If we were in some sort of power distribution application and we were working on a, um, I don't know, 415 kV supergrid line with 100 kiloamps, and we were worried about a transformer because it was saturating and getting hot. What would constitute a small <coughs> signal? 415 kV, 100 kiloamps, how small is small? Let's hear it. Any tapers, how small is small? Any, yeah, about 500 amps I'd say is a small signal. So it depends on the situation. From our point of view, small signals are to do with 0.7 volts being the, <coughs> the bar that we're measuring by. But it depends on what area of electronics you're working in. You could have a biscuit, but I haven't bought any, sorry. It isn't my fault, I haven't got a bottle of water either, so. So let's have a look at an example of a circuit with a large signal. I bought this large signal recently and I've been keeping it in a jar so it won't escape. And the amplitude of the height, or the height of the signal, determines how the circuit is analysed, which is what I said just now. And if the active devices behave linearly or nearly linearly, nearly linearly, over a range of signal excursion, then we can call our large signal circuit a single small signal circuit. 
And if the active device is behaving nonlinearly over the range of signal excursion, that's say height and y axis, we can still linearize our circuit, but we'll have to linearize it into two or more circuits, each of which represent one state of the active devices. So this is a circuit that you're all familiar with, I really, really hope. And we looked at it in the lectures before, before the Christmas holidays. And we were worried about conduction or non-conduction only. So there were, there were two states as far as we were concerned. <coughs> There's some notes just behind you. Gentleman in grey jacket. Yes, good. So the diodes in conduction when the 10 volt source raised above 0.7. Otherwise, it's not in conduction. And we've got the, the current and voltage characteristics on the right. And the voltage is, um, is black and the current is red. So everyone's satisfied with that. Is that all right? I'll take that as a yes. So if we were to, to call this circuit linear, we have to take away the diode because the diode is a nonlinear device. It's, <coughs> Describing the equation is IS brackets e to, the, uh, one, e to the QT upon KV, QV upon KT minus 1, sorry. So that's got an exponential in it, so it's not linear, so we can't have that. So we replace it with a 0.7 volt source. If it's conducting, and if it's not conducting, we'll replace it with an open circuit. They are two linear circuits. One of each represents both states of the diode. This is not new, we've, we've been doing this for ages. Now, of course, we could make this a bit better by adding an extra resistance to follow the diode characteristic. Now, if we were to look at the diode characteristic, it looks a little bit like that. And this is one that I made up. And there is an internal series resistance which is proportional to the slope of the line. So we've got current on y-axis, voltage on x-axis, or voltage anode to cathode. And it depends how much current is flowing as to what that dynamic resistance is. You say R is V over I. So if I did dx by dy and it was a straight line, that would be a resistor. Because you've got volts over amps, which is mostly known. So if I draw a straight line on this characteristic, I can assign it a value of resistance. And as long as the line's straight, it will be a constant number. A single number. So if I said, well, I'm going to have my diode and I'm going to put 15 milliamps, uh, microamps through it by placing 0.72 volts on it, which would be the, the blue, the higher dot, I'll be at the dot. And there won't be any movement up or down the characteristic. But then if I said, well, I will change the voltage slightly by a little bit down to 0.69 and up to 0.73, I would be traversing the range of the blue line. And if I said, well, I'm prepared to accept a small amount of error in the current that I'm seeing, I could say, well, I'll stick to the blue line then. Now, the blue line doesn't quite match the characteristic, but it's fairly close. So over this range, as long as we will accept that fairly close is good enough, we can say the diode looks like 0.72 volts with a resistance of 3.75 kilo ohms in series. Now, a voltage source in series with a resistor is a, <coughs> is a, biscuits really do make you interact, don't they? I mustn't forget ever again. Feminine source. It's nice to know you're also easily bribed. <coughs> um, similarly, if I decided, well, I'm going to operate at about two milliamps, or 0.61 volts, I'd be on the red point. And if I said, well, I will adjust my voltage a bit and see how far I can take this linearization, not really this far, the curvature of the line is much steeper, it's changing, the, the non-linearity is greater in that region, so we can't linearize the diode over nearly as Greater, a greater range, but we could still say 0.61 volts on a source and 31.25 kilo ohms in series. And as long as we're prepared to accept the range of error, that's fine. 
but I wouldn't say below 0 0.59 or above 0 0.62 would be acceptable. But that doesn't change the fact that you can draw the line as far as you want to. So, a model for a diode with internal resistance is a thermion source. And this can improve the accuracy of the diode model, but the diode, mo the diode resistance changes with current, as I said in the previous slide. So, you might need many different values of resistor to analyze your circuit. And in practice, we would never use more than one. Not unless the circumstances were extremely special. And the chances are, if you go into that level of detail, you'd just break out a circuit simulator and not worry too much about it. So we've chosen our fixed resistor based on the operating point, or the quiescent condition. And it's important that the signal is, in quotes, small, with respect to the size of the operating point, or with respect to the nonlinearity that we find around the operating point. So if we go back to the prior slide, I could have a much bigger swing in VAC if I was at the blue operating point than I could if I was at the red operating point to maintain the same degree of accuracy in my calculations. <coughs> so what about an example of all this small signal business? <coughs> Your friend, I assume you all have a friend. Is there anybody without a friend? You my friend. <laughs> Your friend is watching TV in the next room, and you can hear the TV all the time, but the adverts are louder than the normal programming. Um, that's true in this country. It's the adverts that are disturbing your thoughts while attacking a particularly difficult triple E one one eight problem sheet. So this scenario is extremely unlikely with what you're doing problem sheets. <laughs> Your friend is unwilling to turn the TV down, so you need to ditch them. No, so you need to build a, cons a, a circuit to automatically control the volume of the TV to a constant level. And after a bit of googling, you come up with what's on the bottom. So we've got a current source which we're allowed to vary, and I'll assume you've just managed to buy one of these, although you can't actually buy one, you just have to make one out of other electronic components. But for the simplicity of the explanation, I have decided just to say this, com this, this variable current source exists. And that variable current source will pass a current through the diode. And that, the current that we try to force in the diode will make sure that whatever voltage we need to make that current go will be there the current source will just increase its output, its voltage between its terminals in order to make that happen because it will make a certain current flow and it will produce any voltage it needs to make that happen which is why they're imaginary. We've got V1 which is a voltage source and I've shown it as a sine wave because that's usual and this represents the sound output of your telly. So in the well, not that long ago, actually, there would be a little jack on the side just below the one speaker that was beside the giant cathode ray tube. But now you'll have to rustle around the back somewhere and find one of the many outputs to plug into. And we don't know for sure if the sound output from the TV has any DC on it. But if it does, that DC will act to bias QC voltage, will act to bias our diode. And we can't have that because we want to be in control of biasing. So we'll put a capacitor in there to block any DC and just let the sound signal through, which will be AC. And then we have a diode in series with a resistor, R1. And this is, as far as we're concerned, a potential divider. It's a potential divider of R1 and the small signal resistance of the diode. And we're going to ignore the 0.7 volts. That's not to say it's not there, but we will ignore it because it doesn't change with the size of the signals. So the signal there, signal up there, we still don't have to worry about the 0.7. We take it as red that it is there, and then we ignore it. And we don't want that 0.7 to end up going into our measuring equipment, which I've shown as a cathode ray oscilloscope. And a reasonable approximation for an oscilloscope is 10 mega ohms to ground. So if you were in a lab, the top of the O, where the arrow is, would be the bit where you clip the clicky thing on. 
and the bottom of the arrow where VI is would be the way the crocodile clip goes, so that will lead off the side of your probe. So IB sets the operating point or the quiescent conditions of the diode. So whatever IB is, is responsible for how far up the y-axis we are on this graph. And that alone, IB, is in control of how far up the y-axis we are. And we will travel as far as we need to in X to make the right value in Y. Obviously, we can't just wander off the black line. You've got to stay on the black line. <laughs> the one is the TV upper. C1 blocks any DC, as I just said. Uh, R1 is the upper resistor in the potential divider. D1 is the lower, or the, the small signal resistance of D1 is, is the lower resistor in the potential divider. C2 blocks the 0.7 volts on the diode from the CRT, um, CRO, sorry, and R2 is an approximation to a scope probe. So how does it work? Well, the diode dynamic or incremental or series resistance, small signal resistance, all the same thing, varies according to the current that flows through the diode. So it varies according to IB. <coughs> and the quiescent current in the diode, um, okay, the quiescent current in the diode is IB, and a voltage will appear across D1 which is sufficient to sustain the current flowing in it, and it will be approximately 0.7 volts. The value of IB will be set by the average amplitude of the TV output. So there will be some other circuit, which I have not shown, which may well be a peak detector, that will cause a voltage to appear that follows the average volume of the TV signal. And I am saying that there is a magic box which includes this circuit that allows me to control IB based on that average value. And it's really just a peak detector and an op-amp and a few other little bits and pieces. And by the end of the course, we'll go and design it. Um, in fact, if I've got a bit of time at the end, we may actually do one just for fun. That's how you guys have fun, right? Oh, I have fun. So when the TV volume is loud, IB will be large because the average value of the volume will be bigger, so IB will increase. So the dynamic resistance of the diode will be smaller. If we go back to the, <coughs> go back to the graph, the further up the characteristic we go, the smaller the dynamic resistance becomes. If you're unhappy with the fact that the gradient is increasing, don't forget it's dx by dy, not dy by dx. So it's 1 over dy by dx if you prefer. So RD is going to be smaller as the volume goes up. And since RD is the, mm. RD is the dynamic resistance, it's the lower leg of the potential divider across which the output is taken, the volume will go down. And this is a kind of feedback. So going back to the circuit for a minute, if R1 is constant and the resistor that we're going to pop in place of D1 is getting smaller as the volume increases, then our output voltage, which will pass to our amplifier or whatever, is going to drop, which is ideal. On the other hand, if the, the volume coming from the TV is smaller than previously, D1's internal resistance will be larger, and it will take a larger fraction of the overall available voltage. So it's all a question of the relationship between the dynamic resistance of the diode and the value of R1. And I've chosen some reasonable values for this situation. Anybody need to hear again how it works? Or is unhappy at all? Well, obviously you're all very unhappy you're here, but other than that, anybody unhappy? Cool. I don't believe the word, but fine. If you don't like it, you can either come and see me, drop me an email and watch the video again. It's up to you. So we will consider two operating points. That's to say we will inspect essentially the blue dot and the red dot in the prior diagram, back in this slide. We will, we will consider the blue and the, and the red. And we will observe the effect on, on RD and the output of the circuit. 
Now the total diode current, that's to say DC plus AC, everything in, is the sum of the quiescent current, which is flowing due to IB, and the current that flows in the potential divider due to R1, uh, V1. Yes, voltage, current. Mm. Current in the potential divider due to V1. And the linearization of the circuit requires that the signal current that flows through R1 and D1 due to V1 does not change the total current in D1 so much that the exponential shape of the diode's IV characteristic becomes significant. What? Right. All I'm saying there is that we can't travel too far from the dot. Because if we do, the curviness of the black line will become apparent. So to ensure, well, essentially, to ensure that the Thevenin model of the diode holds, the diode characteristic must approximate a straight line, which is what I just said. Happy? Well, broadly happy, actually. This is very difficult. I accept that outright. It's very confusing. It takes ages to wrap your head around it. If anybody says, why is analog hard to go, I don't get the small signal and large signal thing. If they have anything to say other than it just is. So don't panic if it's a little bit weird. So anyway, this is an example diode characteristic when IV is small. And I have called small 314 microns. If you can't see it in the, in the handout, because it is jolly small, um, you'll be able to have a look at it online. So I'm saying a straight line and to make 314 microamps go, you need 532 millivolts across the anode, or between the anode and the cathode. These are real numbers, what I measured, to give a good example. And I am prepared to allow the current to drop to 271 microamps, and that will yield 525 millivolts. And if you run, if you put those two sets of numbers through the diode equation, you'll be able to work out what IS was for this diode, which, if you're in the <coughs> semiconductors, might be thrilling, maybe. Um, on the other hand, I am also prepared to allow the diode quiescent current to raise, or the, the diode total current to raise to 360 microamps, and that will be caused by 538 millivolts anode to cathode. So what I'm saying is somewhere in this space, uh, in Hicks I had a big stick to point these students with, we will start here, and the signal can go this far, and it can go that far, but I don't really want it to go much further, because the line starts to get curvy. Now I drew this line, it's straight, but the real line will deviate from this to some degree, and what I'm worried about is how much deviation I'm going to accept. And we'll see the effect of the deviation at the end of this lecture. So this is IB is small. We can work out the gradient of this, this graph. Is it in the next slide, the gradient? It is. Yeah. Never mind, I was going to ask you to work it out, but if it's in the next slide, it's hardly worth it. We would like to know. It's not that I have no idea what's on the next slide, by the way. Um, we would like to know the small signal resistance of the diode, so we'll do delta I upon delta V, which will give us 1 over RD, which will be... So 1 over RD is measured in Siemens, or Mohs if you're feeling really old. Um, so we'll do del I is 360 minus 271, del V is 538 minus 525, so RD is 146 ohms. And those numbers have dropped straight off that graph. So the total signal current will be 4.7 kilo ohms, which is R1, plus the 146 ohms from the diode is 4,846 ohms. So 41.2 microamps peak to peak. Now 0.2 comes from what V1 was in the very first slide. Oh, not the very, very first slide in the example. This one. Leave one is 0.2 volts.
Why is that the total signal current? Well, going back again, there must be a signal current that flows through R1, and it must flow through D1, and it must flow through C1, and then it must flow through back into V1. So there must be a current in this. Oh, it's, it's not that high after all, or maybe I'm bigger than I thought. There's going to be a current in this loop, which is a signal current, and there'll be a current in this loop, which is also a signal current, and there'll be a current in this loop, which is just a DC current which is the biasing current for the diode. Not that I'm suggesting this is a question of loop analysis. This is not a question of loop analysis at all. But, current still flows in loops. You just wouldn't use loop analysis on this. <coughs> so, a small signal equivalent circuit. So this, this is a small signal equivalent circuit which is a representation more or less, of the whole of the prior circuit with the two capacitors and, and the uh, constant current source in it. The only thing that's missing from this is the 10 mega ohms from the CRT, uh, CRO, oscilloscope. And the reason I've taken that out is 146 ohms is quite small compared to 10 mega ohms, and I'm prepared to ignore it for the sake of a bit of clarity. So we're only dealing with signals. There is no DC in this diagram at all. We accept the DC is there and we prepare to ignore it because we can separate out the problem into the DC bits and the AC bits. And this enormously simplifies things. And when we meet, or when you collectively and I meet again in about six weeks' time, we will carry on with this separation of problems into small and large signals, especially when it comes to transistors. <coughs> But for now, you have to worry about how the signal sees the circuit. So I'm back to my jam jar full of signals. You take the lid off, put your hand over it to stop them escaping. Get the tweezers and slide the tweezers in, just get one, get it out, and then because it will escape otherwise. And it will escape to, this is not madness, it will escape to ground. The signal wants to get to ground, always and forever, and it will do it any way it can. And you drop it on the circuit, where you want to know what the, uh, the resistance looking off that node is, and then you work out what the signal does, and that will tell you what calculations you need to make. So this is how the signal sees the circuit. The signal leaves the, the, uh, the voltage source. It doesn't encounter a capacitor. Why doesn't it encounter a capacitor? There's definitely one there. I saw it in the prior, prior diagram. You can have a really big imaginary biscuit if you're prepared to attempt an answer as to where the capacitor went. Think about what value the capacitor might take. It have zero impedance, so it would be More or less, yeah. It would have very low impedance. I will have designed, there is no reason for you to know that, but I thought I'd give it a try anyway. We will go over why the capacitor disappears when I see you again, but for now, if we said, I don't know, one, kilo, one kilohertz will be, our, will be our signal frequency, so we have 0.2 volts, one kilohertz here, what's the impedance of the capacitor that I've chosen? Not very big compared to 4.7 kilo ohms. That's the important thing. As far as the signal is concerned, the resistor is much, much bigger than the capacitor in terms of resistance or impedance. So we can say that the capacitor, as you rightly said, is a short circuit, and then we'll, we'll take it away. The only job of the capacitor is to stop the DC flow. And if you do 1 over 2 by FC and F is 0, which is DC, you'll find that infinity is the art where it was an error, in fact. So that's where the two capacitors disappear off to. And the constant current source is just that, a constant current. So if it's a constant current and we're only worried about signals, we can take that away as well. Uh, 
and that leaves us with the circuit we've got, two resistors. Same goes to the 0.7 or 0.53, whatever it was, that goes to. So we can say that V out over V in is 146 over 4700 plus 146, which is 0.03. So we have a reduction in the size of the ripple, or the size of the signal, did I let slip some comparison there? Um, the size of the signal of 1 to 0.03. So this is quite a, a big reduction in the, in the value, and the sound that the TV is putting out will go down considerably as a result. It is the same way of working when the question says, <clears throat> you now connect a Zener diode regulator your, to your output of your power supply, and we want to know what the reduction in ripple will be due to the Zener diode. It's the same sort of maths that's involved. So what about when IB is large? Large, I've said, is 10 milliamps, and my linearization falls in the range 10 milliamps to 10.8 milliamps, and 10 milliamps down to 9.2 milliamps, and <coughs> that requires a range of voltage anode to cathode from 690 to 698 millivolts. The reason all these graphs are hand drawn is not due to my laziness. It's last year. People did so appallingly on the midterm, and one of the things I found that they couldn't do is draw graphs by hand. So last year, I made them do all the graphs in the lecture. But when I looked at the, uh, the midterms this year, I thought, yeah, it's not too bad. So you don't have to draw the graphs. So we can do some more important parameters. <coughs> and it's the same maths, except now, <coughs> RD turns out to be 5 ohms, which is really small. And the total signal current is 42.5 microamps, because the 4.7 kiloohms is still by far the biggest resistance. In fact, making R1 much bigger than RD controls <coughs> the value of our total. That is to say the, the total resistance. And it keeps the peak value of I, the current in the diode, almost constant. Now, I don't really mind if you either don't think about why that's important, or you don't care, or you don't get it. That's not very important to me. It's just a curiosity of this circuit. But if you do think about it, you could convince yourself that that's quite important. Because if I said I've got some signals, and depending on the size of the signal, it will change my quiescent conditions. That's broadly what I just said. I don't want to change my quiescent conditions based on my signal. I've got another current source, IB, to set my quiescent conditions. I'm very keen that that's what IB's job is. So I won't allow my signal voltages to upset my quiescent conditions. If I did, I'd be breaking the, uh, the disconnection I'd made between my DC bits and my AC bits. So he's actually critical. But for now, we can just let it go. We will come back to it, though, eventually. So there is a small signal equivalent circuit and it's developed by the same means as the prior one. And the ratio is now down to just over 1 over 1000. So that's really loads of, uh, loads of attenuation. So now the TV is going to be really quiet. One way or the other, your friend is now sat a few inches away from the TV in order that they can hear it. Because it's really quiet. So, how does this look on a characteristic? Well, this is a diode characteristic, and I've got two currents. And I've got two currents because I've set the current broadly, broadly constant. That's to say 42 point something micrograms. I've kept it more or less the same. The only thing I'm doing is adjusting the DC current in the diode changes diode resistance. <coughs> so if we look at, if you can't read the text, it, the y-axis of I, which is the farthest left, is IQ1, is the middle value of the upper sine wave. 
IQ2 is the lower value of the is the middle value of the lower sine wave. The main axis in Y is labelled ID, and the main axis in X is labelled VAC. And the two midpoints of the x-axis sine waves, that's a bit there and a bit there, are both labelled VQ1 and VQ2. So these are the quiescent points, and the signal moves about them. That's to say above and below. And we can look at what will happen to the voltage across the 10 megaohm resistor, which is essentially equivalent to the x-axis graphs that go downwards due to the current that flows. Now, the two currents that I've got flowing are the same, more or less. Yet, there is a big difference in the size of the output voltage. This should not be too surprising, because what I wanted was a system that would allow me to shrink the size of the voltage or increase it. I can't increase it any bigger than it was when it started, but I can certainly make it smaller. So, and I also said that as far as I go up, this, up the curve, the bigger the ratio of the resistances will be, because RD is getting smaller. And I get a smaller share of the voltage across my output, across my uh, 10 megaohm resistor. And that's exactly what's happening. I've got a low quiescent current, just there, and I've got quite a large signal excursion for a given input, which is the two inputs the same. On the other hand, operating at a higher quiescent point, I've got a much smaller signal excursion. So this is, in quotes, compression. Something else you'll notice about this diagram is the shape of the waveform is not quite right. In fact, the distance from the minimum to the middle is not the same as the distance from the middle in quotes is not the same as the maximum to the middle. So something has happened here because I've been sat about with straight lines in my ruler and so forth but on this characteristic you can see what happens if you break your rule about the line has to be straight. If the line isn't straight, this, this line here is not sufficiently straight across this region between this dashed line and this dashed line, the line is not sufficiently straight in order that we can call it one value of resistor. We know this because this height is different to that height. So middle to peak excursion and middle to minimum excursion are not the same. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the sound that you get out will be distorted. Probably not too badly in that case, but these are just signals that I've made up. And the important thing is that the, the distortion does not exist in the beginning. Either the two currents that I'm inputting are equal to each other, identical, in terms of their signal properties. Yet, the voltage signals we get out are changed, and they are changed because of the nonlinearity of the diode. So, I'm, I'm calling these two small, even though one of them is not really small enough. <coughs> so what happens if it's actually a large signal? <coughs> All we have to do is take it to some extreme and see what happens. So, Y axis is well, Y axes rather are ID, so the diode current, and X axes are or the X axis here is that known to cathode voltage, that's time and that's time as well. So now I've made the signal so big that it's capable of switching the diode off, more or less. Very close anyway. The the lowest point here almost gets us to the point where there's no current in the diode. No current in the diode means diode switched off. So the signal's now so big it's causing the diode to switch on and off or to change state. So we would think about this circuit, even though it's got signals in it, signals aren't small, so they must be large, so we'd go back into a situation 
where we have two circuits, each of which are linear, and differently well, they will, each one of those will represent one state of the diode. So what I'm drawing in this, this obviously you can see that, this is the output from that circuit. <coughs> if you were to, more or less, I've actually put the other half in as well, so it's not quite the same, but it's fairly close. We have a situation where we need diode conducting and diode not conducting. More or less I'm saying any second now the diode is going to switch off and this could drop all the way to there. So, what have we actually said? Well, I've introduced the idea of small and large signals explicitly for the first time. And I've also introduced the idea of dynamic resistance, or small signal resistance, or incremental resistance. Now, the idea of incremental resistance is not new. It's the same idea that we used for the Zener diode problems just before Christmas, when we said how much would the ripple reduce. And we will come to see it again when we deal with transistors. We've compared the voltage source model of the Thevenin, which should be capitalised, model of the diode. So we've added a resistor in series with our diode. And we've considered how capacitors can be used to block quiescent conditions, DC, but pass AC. By choosing their value judiciously and knowing what the signal frequency is going to be. And that's to say you do 1 over 2 by FC and if whatever you get for XC is much smaller than most of your resistors then the capacitor choice is alright for the bottom capacitor. I've got a few minutes yet so settle down. We've introduced the idea of a small signal equivalent circuit. That's to, see, that's to say a circuit which expresses how a signal views the circuit that you put it into. Obviously you don't really keep signals in a jam jar, I do obviously, but you guys don't. Um, and you put them in with voltage sources like everybody else. And we've used the device, or a diode in this case, to examine the idea of operating points, and the idea of linearity, and the idea of separating problems out into DC and AC. Now, you may be thinking, well, We've just, we're just about to stop doing diodes. Why have you kept this secret till the end? One, because I wanted to do everything else first, because otherwise this would sound like a load of voodoo. And secondly, because next time we will meet, we'll be about to start discussing transistors, where the idea of small signal and large signal will really become a big thing. So, you will be back with Professor Houston tomorrow. Uh, I don't know where you are because I haven't looked at the timetable yet. But um, he will start off probably with a review of diodes and then he'll go straight into transistors of one kind or another. And I will see you again around week seven or week eight. If you need, if you just out of interest, who's watched the A video? <coughs> That's about half. No, worth, what, what, are they all right? You can stream them sufficiently quickly and so forth. Every now knows what electrical is then. Good. Right, well, I think I'm more or less done. There's the bear. If you've got any trouble with analog, drop me an email. <laughs>